There have been a lot of Star Wars role-playing games to come out over the years, to the point where you're really spoiled for choice as to what flavor of mechanics you want. There's the old West End games, Star Wars, from 1987, and re-released in 2018, which uses handfuls of D6s to resolve conflicts. Then there's the Wizards of the Coast Star Wars, which uses their old D20 framework. The rules pretty closely tracked D&D 3E, and then when they rehashed it as the Saga Edition, the rules leaned more towards D&D 4E. And finally, at least among the officially licensed RPGs, there's Fantasy Flight Games Star Wars, released in 2012, which uses their Genesis system. This product line produced a ton of supplements for a solid 10 years, and despite what you may have heard about the confusing specialty dice, everyone who actually learned and played this game loved it. At the time of this recording, this particular iteration of Star Wars has been sold by Fantasy Flight Games to another company, although they do retain the license to a bunch of other Star Wars games that aren't RPGs. One of the barriers to entry, besides the specialty dice for this game, was the fact that it was released as three separate variations of the same game. Edge of the Empire for rough and tumble Outer Rim adventures, Age of Rebellion where you're more directly interfacing with the war against the Empire in the original trilogy time period, at least initially, and Force and Destiny where you're also in that same time period, at least initially, but the emphasis is on being force sensitive and engaging in the more mystical side of the setting. I mentioned these three books because I think it was a great way to approach the Star Wars universe, which by 2012 had already become so massive and well realized that you could really subdivide the setting into distinct themes like that. Which brings me to some other Star Wars games, ones that are not licensed, and one of which I think might be the very best Star Wars RPG of them all. That game is Scum and Villainy, which I'll get to in a minute, but first, let's take a look at the sponsor for this video. This video is brought to you by Sintima Sundered Wild an RPG where you play as insectoid explorers who traverse a mutated, storm-swept wilderness of sky islands in an airship. The core rulebook runs 150 or so pages and includes tons of detail about the unique setting as well as mechanics for building your own airship. But the Kickstarter also includes the option to pick up three zines which each contain a fully realized floating island furnished with multiple regions, dozens of landmarks, and tons of NPCs. As an explorer, you choose from 12 playable tribes and can craft not only your own airship, but your own equipment and gear, and face off against various kinds of energy storms, mutated creatures, and behemoths. This project also includes 50 monsters from the original game in a separate bestiary that is compatible with D&D 5e rules. You can actually download a free adventure from the Kickstarter page now. It includes the basic rules, 6 pre-generated characters, and a short quest with a full color map. Check out Sentima Sundered Isles on Kickstarter now. The link is down below. Now, back to the video. There are a number of very small indie RPGs that sort of carve off a piece of the Star Wars experience for you to nibble on, like Star Wars Streets of Moss Eisley, a free 19-page game that puts you in a very specific time and place in the saga and uses the Powered by the Apocalypse rules paradigm. Then there's Never Tell Me the Odds, a 72-page game by David Somerville that sets you up for one-shots playing exclusively as scoundrels. For a more comprehensive experience, there is Star Wars 5e, which you guessed it, is Star Wars using the D&D 5e SRD. If you happen to be cool with 5e rules, this is a particularly appealing option because not only is the game free and freely accessible on a really nice website, it's fairly well detailed in terms of races, gear, and starships. In fact, it might be worth bookmarking this site if you don't already have access to the licensed RPGs, which themselves serve as great lore references. I also have to mention Starforged, which was published in 2022 by Sean Tompkin, and which I've actually reviewed on this channel. It's another game that uses the Powered by the Apocalypse paradigm, but with some fairly innovative additions. It does not mention Star Wars by name, and you don't necessarily get the impression that the author was thinking Star Wars when he wrote it, but the game can rather incredibly recreate the episode-to-episode -episode plotline of the show The Mandalorian, which came as a surprise to the author when the show first came out, and has since become a little side project that he tends to from time to time. It's actually pretty crazy. Sometimes when I watch The Mandalorian, I actively wonder if they were just playing Star Forged in order to come up with what happens in an episode. But here's the thing, out of all the Star Wars RPGs out there, each of them with their own approach to recreating the Star Wars experience, there's one that I think beats them all. Scum and Villainy by Strauss, Asimovich, and John LaBeouf Little, published in 2018 by Evil Hat Games. 
Now, I say that with a few conditions. Obviously, when I say best, I'm just being completely subjective. And here are the specific criteria I'm using. One, a game that is available for purchase at a normal retail price. Sure, you can get the old licensed games on eBay or wait for some official reprint, or you can bootleg them, which I do not advocate or condone on this channel or anywhere. But if I want a game that I can buy in PDF and print from the creator at a normal price at the time of this recording, Scum and Villainy fits that bill. Two, not too complex. I think if we're being honest here, the West End library of Star Wars books, as well as the Fantasy Flight line of books, are awesome treatments of the Star Wars universe. But whether you're talking about D6, D20, or the Genesis rule system, they're complex games. What I look for in a game is one that I can actually get to the table, one that people will be willing to pick up and play. Scum and Villainy is a pretty straightforward forged in the dark hack and can be fairly considered to be on the easier side of the spectrum. Three, not too simple. I do appreciate games like Star Worlds and Never Tell Me the Odds, but those are just a bit underbaked when it comes to longevity and play. They're either too casual or too short to be unpacked for a campaign. So with those three criteria in mind, there's only one Star Wars game left standing, Scum and Villainy, which is technically not claiming to be a Star Wars game, but is very much so in spirit. Here's a synopsis of the game's native setting, and I'll include the Star Wars equivalent on screen for you. The galaxy is ruled by the Hegemony, a powerful government headquartered in the center of the galaxy and whose influence drops off considerably in the Outer Rim. Roaming the galaxy are mystics who can attune using the Way. The first listed artifact example that a mystic can use is a Light Blade, which uses a focusing crystal and has the appearance of a small metal tube. Urbots are sentient robots which can be found everywhere and do all sorts of tasks. Now, there is some connective tissue between the setting of this game and the rules, so you can't just hack away the setting in its entirety and transplant all of Star Wars in. For example, the precursor artifacts are meant to be special items that have powerful effects, but also carry with them either a glitch or a jinx or curse. There's no direct Star Wars analog to this, at least not that many examples, so you'd have to reconcile that in your game. Another big split between this game's setting and Star Wars canon is how FTL travel works. In Star Wars, ships that are capable of hyperspace travel can simply go wherever they want. Of all the countless Star Wars movies and shows I've watched at this point, hyperspace jumps are not restricted by location and really, travel times are hand-waved 99% of the time. But in the native setting here, all hyperspace travel is limited to leaving and arriving through jump gates. This has huge implications on your story because jump gates are controlled in this universe by powerful factions such as the hegemony and certain guilds. So to reconcile that with the Star Wars universe, you have to do a bit of heavy lifting. The fact is, this game is focused on singular missions that likely take place at a single location or at most a single star system. So you don't have to confront the issue of jump gates and interstellar travel restrictions until you get to the downtime phase of the game. Speaking of phases of the game, how exactly does this game work? If you're acquainted with the whole Blades in the Dark, Forged in the Dark rules paradigm, then you already pretty much fully understand how Scum and Villainy works. I made a video a few years back that explains the rules of Blades in the Dark in a fairly short take, so you can check that out. For this video, I'll just cover the basics of the system. The game is broken down into three phases. Free play, where it most resembles a normal RPG where characters go places and talk to NPCs. Then the job phase, which players initiate by making an engagement role to establish how their operation started, and then you jump into the action. This is one of the hallmarks of the Forged in the Dark paradigm, just resolving all the lead up to an operation with a single role, and then skipping ahead to where the interesting portion begins. The actual job, part of the job phase may consist of a handful of scenes and usually concludes with a getaway or escape from the scene. And finally, there's the downtime scene, which is composed of a number of options for players, payoffs and upkeep, heat management, which refers to the amount of attention the PCs have attracted from law enforcement or the powers that be in any given star system, entanglements, which are a range of complications more descriptive and mechanical in scope than the heat meter, and which can involve any number of factions, and downtime activities, which include indulging in vices to reduce stress points, working on crafting, or healing injuries. As far as how to resolve actions in the game with dice, each PC has 12 actions described across three attributes. 
If you have a point rating in an action, that represents one D6 that you can throw on a check. So this is a D6 dice pool paradigm where the more points you have in an action, the more dice you can roll. On any given throw, you're looking for the highest die. If the highest is a one, two, or three, that is a failure. A four or five is a partial success, a six is a success, and multiple sixes are critical successes. One notable feature of the rules is that you can resist the consequence of a roll by making a resistance roll, which always results in successfully resisting, but the roll itself will determine how much stress you actually take on as a result. You can also push yourself to do any of these things before a roll, but take two stress as a result. When your stress is filled up, you take on a level of trauma. There are eight trauma conditions to choose from, which may not all be that great since your character might already exhibit some of these characteristics even when they're perfectly healthy but here they are there is a whole infrastructure built around how action roles are assessed in this game called position and effect that i won't really get into here but basically before any action role the gm determines the narrative position that a pc is coming from either controlled risky or desperate and then they determine the effect level of the action either limited standard or great so, for example, with the action Attune, which is essentially the game's use of the Force, you can see a description of different partial success results under the three possible positions through which the Attune roll takes place and across a couple of the different effect possibilities. It's also worth mentioning Devil's Bargains, where the player can subvert a roll completely by discussing with the GM a trade-off. Instead of suffering the consequences of a roll, they can take some other narrative or mechanical harm to their character or their party. The reason this is notable is because Forged in the Dark rules give players ample opportunities to bend or avoid the outcome of the dice, which, when used well, means that a story keeps chugging along in the most interesting and cinematic way instead of taking constant left turns due to bad dice rolls. In this sense, Scum and Villainy is a lot more about storytelling than its traditional RPG cousins like the D6 and D20 official Star Wars games. One of the most important features of this game is the fact that the party's existence is really centered around their ship. They choose a ship archetype at the onset, and depending on that choice, as well as what kind of reputation they want that ship to have, that determines the tone and flavor of the story to be told at the table. Over time, the players can upgrade the ship through a variety of modules. By the way, this game also comes with all the cheat sheets you could ever need, including this one. The book itself runs a whopping 370 pages, but you could almost get away with understanding and running the game with just the copious and well-designed rules summary sheets. Anyway, take a look at the actual sheet you use to track a party's starship. It's really pretty much a player character that the party tends to and levels up over time. The ship as a character is a running theme in a lot of Star Wars stories, with the most famous one being the Millennium Falcon, but also Ghost from Rebels, Razor Crest Slave One, and the N2 fighter from The Mandalorian, not to mention Bo-Katan's transport fighter, the Gauntlet. So the big question in the end here is, how do you make Scum and Villainy into a brand name Star Wars story adventure game? The way I see it, there are three approaches. The first is, basically find and replace words and concepts in the book as needed. The way is the force, the hegemony is the empire, Urbots are droids, etc. This is a lot of busy work, and I'm not sure exactly how you go about it aside from editing the book and play sheets themselves. If you have a publishing program like Affinity Publisher or Adobe InDesign, you can open the PDF there and edit the PDFs directly. Or maybe there are some powerful PDF editors out there that you might know of. The second approach would be to use existing publications. The most notable adaptations include A Hive of Scum and Villainy, which introduces light and dark side mechanics, and offers a number of more thematically named playbooks. Then there's Hut Space, a collection of resources written and illustrated by Tim Denay, who, if you're a fan of this channel, you've already seen his work. He wrote and illustrated the thousand-year-old vampire story that I animated and narrated in a video. His Hut Space resources allow you to comfortably set your scum and villainy adventure inside of some pretty well-realized canon. The third approach is one that I thought of myself, and which would require the least amount of work. It would be to just use the default setting that is included in Scum and Villainy, the jump gates, the hegemony, all that, and just consider it taking place in the Star Wars universe, but maybe 10 or 20 or 100,000 years in the future. Place it so far in the future that no canon has yet been written, and where the notions of Sith and Jedi are completely forgotten. 
All that's left are myths and vestiges of an ancient civilization. Hyperspace travel has been forgotten and rediscovered, but it's only a shadow of its former self and requires jump gates in order to operate. As long as your players are amenable to all this, then you don't have to change a thing from the book. So in conclusion, the most important reason why Scum and Villainy is my choice as the best Star Wars engine is because of the John Harper Blades in the Dark approach to fiction. In Blades in the Dark and all the Forged in the Dark games like this, players at the table are thought of as screenwriters and directors who sort of step in and out of their character's role, but who have a larger meta role as story coordinator. So in the end, the game is not about hit point and gear management like it is with your D6 and D20 variants. It's about the story. Your character doesn't have a pool of hit points, for example. They have named descriptive injuries, either physical or psychological. And there's no list of gear. You just have what you need or you don't. Storytelling is what Star Wars, at least in the movies and TV shows, are all about, not nitty gritty HP and gear management. So hats off to Strauss and John for creating the ultimate Star Wars RPG, even if they didn't have the license to do so. I've left links down below for all the games and supplements that I've mentioned in this video. And if you'd like to keep the channel going, please consider joining my Patreon. Thanks as always for watching. See ya.